Good morning and welcome to another Monday. <laughs> I was scrambling around looking for the stand for my phone, so <laughs> I apologize for being a few minutes late there. Blondie here sometimes misplaces things and likes to blame others. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you hear the uh huh in the background? Well, in today's reading, and this is I'm Denise Pass with Seeing Deep Ministries, where we see deep in a shallow world and we overcome the battles of the mind with the Word of God. And today we're in the book of John, chapters 5 and 6. A little overview of today's reading. In John 5, we see Jesus' third miracle and Jesus teaching about his relationship with his Father, about life and about judgment and his testimony and witnesses about himself. Jesus is laying a case to help people believe. Much like in a court of law, there is the burden of proof, and Jesus tries to help the people see. In John 6, there's the fourth and fifth sign or miracle, and then Jesus reveals himself as the bread of life. So we open up today's reading with Jesus' third sign or miracle, healing a man who had been disabled for 38 years. The man was near the pool called Bethesda, which was well known, and actually people can still go visit this site today. And people believe that the water there had the power to cure people. You know there's a problem when we're putting our faith and hope in the created, right? When people say, hey, if you'll just touch this or just do this, you're going to be cured. Really, it's God who does the healing and the curing, right? I mean, God provides things that naturally can help be a remedy. But if we're looking for a miracle, it's better to go to Jesus than a pool of water. Uh, in fact, the fact that scripture says there were many disabled in the water, they were still in the water. But while many disabled were in the pool and the man could not get into the pool, it was a word from Jesus that healed him. The Jewish leaders were angry at this healing because the man was carrying his mat on the Sabbath. We all know that's a no-no. <laughs> Though they said that this was against God's law, it actually wasn't. Uh, they, God had told the Jews that they must not work on the Sabbath, okay? So that one law, and then made about 30 or I don't know how many more additional rules about what work looked like, what qualified and counted as work. So these extra rules were what they were talking about. And evidently carrying a mat meant work to them. Because of this, persecution began for Jesus. As it says in John 5, verse 16, Therefore the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Okay, so you know what's behind that, though, is pride. They thought they had the authority to establish what goes on on the Sabbath. But how many of us know that the only one who has the authority is God himself, he already defined it in scripture, and his son also defines it. But they, so there was a, a pride, and there was um, jealousy. You know, who's Jesus coming with authority telling us, you can pick up your mat? They didn't even think about the fact that, gee, this is like a miracle. Hello, this might be the Messiah. You know, um, that was the thing they were looking for, but they missed it. Because they thought he should have come in a certain way and done things according to their fashion. Don't you know today there's a lot of people who make their own Jesus. This is what Jesus is supposed to do for me. You know, I'm supposed to have a perfect life. Uh, this or that is supposed to happen. Well, Jesus just tells us to look at himself, we'll see the Father. And so... And more than that, the Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus. So they wanted to persecute him because he's breaking their rules on the Sabbath. They want to kill him because of his testimony of being God's son. As it says in John 5, verses 17 and 18, Jesus responded to them, My father is still working, and I am working also. This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father making himself equal to God. So we learn from this, don't follow religion. Don't make up your own way of who Jesus is. Take who Jesus is from the word of God. Don't follow religion, follow Jesus. 
Jesus explains to us who he is. He calls himself the Son of God. He calls himself the Son of Man here in this chapter. And he explains that God has made Jesus the judge. Now, I can imagine if I'm a Pharisee and I like my position, you know, I get honor and I've made these extra rules, people are going to obey them. Someone comes and says, pick up your mat and walk. And heals on the Sabbath, things that I forbid. Then suddenly for that person to say that they are the judge, that's fighting words, right? <laughs> Wait a minute. God is the judge. Who are you to say that you are the judge? John 5.22 says, The Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Verse 23, So that all people may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And in John 5, 26 uh, and 27, it says, And he granted him the right to pass judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Notice that Jesus has this recurring phrase. I think it was like probably six or seven times that I saw in both chapters 15 and 16. And it's, Truly, I tell you. And so when something appears in Scripture more than once in a passage you're reading, you want to pause and say, why does Jesus keep saying that? I mean, we know he's not a liar, right? He's telling the truth. But he's saying this phrase many times. It's to catch the listener's ear. And it appears in verses 19, 24, and 25 in chapter 15 and a few other times in chapter 16. So here's what gotquestions.org had to say about this phrase. At various times in the Gospels, Jesus introduces a statement using phrases such as verily I say or truly I say to the, this to you. In the Gospel of John, G Jesus frequently uses the phrase truly, truly or verily, verily. These expressions all use the Greek word amen. Taken directly from the Hebrew word amen. This word has different implications depending on how and where it is used. Jesus' application of the term is noticeably different from prior uses. We all know in modern uses, the word amen is typically used at the end of a prayer. It may also be sh spoken to show agreement with some statement or idea. This is slightly different from, but closely related to, the original use of the term as seen in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word amen literally means, so be it. The term is an expression of complete and total agreement. In passages such as 1 Chronicles 16, verse 36, or Deuteronomy 27, 15, 26, this is how the term is used, total agreement. Placing the word amen at the end of a statement is a way of accepting, agreeing, or endorsing what came before. We probably don't think about it much when we say it, right? We just say amen. Well, so be it. Like, we 100% agree with that. Jesus, however, was fond of saying amen before making a statement or giving a message. When used in this way, the word amen has slightly different implications. Leading off with amen not only implies that what follows is true, but also that the person making this statement has first-hand knowledge and authority about it. Saying verily, verily before making a statement is a strong claim to truth presented from an almost audacious, audacious attitude. Speaking on worldly or secular matters, saying verily, verily would imply that what follows is that person's own original idea. So, when Jesus leads off with the words verily, verily in verses, or truly, truly, in verses Matthew 18, 3, Mark 3, 28, Luke 23, 43, and John 8, 51, he's not merely saying, believe me, this is true. He's actually saying, I know this is true firsthand. Since many of these comments are in heavenly, spiritual, or godly issues, Jesus' use of verily, verily is part of his consistent claim of divinity. Jesus is not merely aware of these truths. He is the truth, and he is the one who originated them. The disciples and others listening to Jesus' words would have understood his use of these phrases in exactly that way. So when we read Jesus' words and see statements beginning with verily, truly, or some variation, we should recall the deeper meaning. Those claims are not only Jesus' opinion on the truth, 
Those are ideas about which he has intimate, personal, first-hand knowledge. He is God in the flesh. So Jesus had authority, and his authority convicted others. Jesus used his authority to try to open their eyes and ears so they could understand. He provided a backdrop of those who were witnesses to him. And this, I love this scripture of the day, John 5, uh, I put 39 through 44, but I'm going to tack on verse 38. And you do not have his message in your hearts, because you do not believe me, the one he sent to you. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Your approval means nothing to me. Because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my Father's name and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe. For you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. I know this is something in my own life I battled with for years. I cared so much about what people thought about me. And it wasn't until many years later that I realized it just matters about what God thinks about me. Because man is fickle and that opinion can change rapidly, right? But what God says about us is the final word. <laughs> Praise God. And when he saved us and redeemed our souls, we don't need to doubt that anymore. But we need to be careful about what we believe. Do we believe man and his opinion about God, or do we believe God and his word? It's not just knowing or reading the scriptures that leads to eternal life. We have to come to the point of belief. The Pharisees missed it. So can we. The work of God is to believe. John 6, 29, Jesus replied, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. But the Pharisees were busy making lots of extra work, lots of extra rules. We can do that in our life, too. What we simply need to do is believe. Believe in Jesus. And then we got to be under his lordship, right? So when I say, and then, I'm not adding to that work. The only way we can be saved is what Jesus said. But proof of that salvation will be evident in our lives. Because if we really believe in Jesus, then our lives are going to be radically different. I know mine has been. And so, uh, continuing on in John 6, verse 30, What sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you? They asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then he shares about how they're going to have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And let's just say that that didn't go over so well. People are like, what is he talking about? And so many people left him because they didn't understand. You know, I think a lot of times today, people don't understand. It's like there's a veil over them. They don't understand his word and they don't seek to understand. That's what we have to do. We have to say, God, I don't understand this. Holy Spirit, will you show me? And then, hey, let's actually study God's Word. And let's use the resources and tools that everybody has access to, the Internet. And what does this mean? And there's a lot of incredible commentaries and other things that can help us understand. We don't have to be offended by Jesus. This is what caused the Pharisees to stumble. They were offended. They were offended by His authority. They were offended by the fact that he didn't do things the way they thought he should do things. We see that today. People say, God has allowed this to happen to me, or I don't understand why God doesn't do this. Truly, as Jesus said, truly I say to you, the work is just to believe in me. He didn't say our life would be perfect. He didn't say we'd ever always get things our way. If that's the Jesus we want to worship, we're not worshiping the one true God. And so we need to think about which Jesus we're worshiping this morning. Out of the Easy English Bible Commentary, it talks about those verses uh, in chapter 16, verses 60 through 66. 
Jesus' speech in the synagogue was difficult to understand, but it was difficult also for his Jewish audience to accept as the truth. Jesus was saying that he had come down from heaven, and he was saying that he would return there again. Also, he's saying that people had to eat his flesh and drink his blood. This idea would have set them, upset them very much. But Jesus did not argue with them. Instead, he tried to explain that his words had a spiritual meaning, not a physical meaning. People need the help of the Holy Spirit in order to understand that they need God's life. It is the Father who makes them come to Jesus. They can receive that life only by means of the same Spirit. Jesus' words were from the Holy Spirit. So you guys, there's a lot in here, isn't there? We see miracles. We see Jesus teaching us truths that are so profound and yet so simple, if we'll just believe. Don't follow religion. This is our final application today. Follow Jesus. The work that remains is that we believe. Do you believe today, friend? Look, there might be things that cause you to doubt. I get that. I've been there. But right now, you can make a choice. Right now. You and God, you can get on your knees and say, God, help my unbelief. That's what I did. I was 19 years old. I confessed I didn't believe. I said, God, help my unbelief. Will you help me to see and understand? And in that moment, I understood. I was a sinner on a fast track to hell, y'all. Apart from the grace of God, I needed to be saved. Friends, please don't reject the only one who can save you. Don't let there be a stumbling block. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus came to set you free and to give you eternal life. He has the authority to do that. No one else does. And you don't either, my friend. A lot of people try to think that we can be our own God and we make up our own rules and humanism. That won't save us. And we do need saving. I promise you this. So the work that remains is to believe, and when we don't understand what Jesus or God's word means, we can ask the Holy Spirit. Let's ask him now, shall we? Lord Jesus, I just pray for everybody listening, God, where we don't understand you, God, or we don't understand your word, please make it evident to us. Open up our eyes, God. Open up the eyes of our heart that we may understand how good you are and that your word is true, and help us to live it out. God, we don't want to be blind. We don't want to follow religion or rules. You've set us free from the law, God, because you fulfilled it on our behalf. Help us to obey you, God, and to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys, go with God. Thank you for being here today, and Lord willing, we'll catch you tomorrow. Bye-bye.